Palestinian leaders threaten to end all communication with the U.S. government. That's after the Trump administration said it will close the PLO's office in Washington. So what's behind this move? And what does it mean for Trump's peace plan? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Over the past 50 years, since the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, there have been countless talks, negotiations and UN resolutions. And the Palestinian Liberation Organization has been at the forefront of peace talks over the years. But now Donald Trump's administration says it will shut down the PLO's office in Washington, D.C. That's in response to Palestinian efforts to raise the issue of Israel's occupation at the International Criminal Court. And if the U.S. goes ahead with its plans, Palestinians say they will end all communication with Washington. We have a lot to get to with our guests, but first, this report from Diane Estabrook. The planned closure of the Palestinian Liberation Organization's office in Washington prompted shock and a threat from a senior Palestinian official to freeze ties with the U.S. This is very unfortunate, un unacceptable. This is the pressure uh, being exerted on this administration from the Netanyahu government. At a time when we're trying to cooperate to achieve the ultimate deal, they take such steps which will undermine the whole peace process. The U.S. State Department announced its decision to close the office late last week, citing a 2015 law placing conditions on the U.S. mission office. Those conditions relate to the Palestinians pressuring the International Criminal Court to seek charges against Israel over the issue of Israeli settlements and crimes against Palestinians. The move comes as the Trump administration is trying to broker a peace plan between the Palestinians and Israelis. President Donald Trump said such a deal would be a cornerstone of his administration. Thank you very much. In September, he met with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly meeting of world leaders in New York. And last month, the president sent his son-in-law and advisor, Jared Kushner, to the Middle East in part to work out a blueprint for a deal. The White House says closing the PLO office doesn't mean it's cutting off communications with the Palestinians and could be viewed as a way to expedite the peace process. But a Middle East analyst says the Trump administration is not bargaining in good faith. The U.S. is not an honest broker. The U.S. is representing its own interests and they correspond primarily with the right wing of Israeli interests. The closure isn't a done deal. President Trump has 90 days to review the decision and could keep the office open if he thinks the Palestinians are engaged in meaningful and direct negotiations with the Israelis. Diane Estabrook, Al Jazeera, Washington. The Palestinian Liberation Organization is recognized as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people by more than 100 countries, including Israel. It was established in 1964 to liberate Palestine with the help of armed struggle. For decades, the PLO sat on the list of terrorist organizations in the U.S. and Israel. That lasted until the organization represented the Palestinians when the so-called peace process began in Madrid in 1991. Now, since then, the PLO has been the only negotiating player speaking on behalf of the Palestinians in all direct and indirect talks with Israel. OK, let's bring in our guests now. And joining us from Ramallah, we have Kais Abdul Karim, a member of the Palestinian Liberation Organization in Washington, D.C. Hilary Mann Leverett, a former White House national security and State Department official. And in London, Ian Black, visiting senior fellow at the Middle East Centre, London School of Economics. A very warm welcome to all of you. Kais, let's start by getting some reaction from you on the planned closure of the PLL's, PLO's office in DC. In actual fact, uh, it is an actual closure because uh, the office has been notified to uh, freeze and stop all its activities in the United States. Uh, pending the 90-day uh, uh, time timetable in order uh, for the new for the uh, government for the U.S. government to decide <coughs> what are the uh, compliance measures that they uh, have decided will uh, 
be met by the PLO. So in actual fact, the uh, PLO office is already uh, closed, although it's mm. not uh, closed physically, but uh, by its activity. The uh, act, uh, in my opinion, is an act by the, as a measure by the United States to disqualify itself as a broker for the uh, peace uh, uh, process in the Middle East. Because you cannot play a role as broker if you are completely biased to one side uh, of the conflict uh, on the expense of the other side. And it is only uh, that the Palestinians are supposed to meet the qualifications of co compliance that the United States sets unilaterally. Uh, on the other hand, the Israelis are not asked to do anything. It is mm. also a paradox that this uh, measure against the PLO office was taken at the same time that the Netanyahu government had decided to forcibly evict uh, 57 Palestinian uh, Bedouin uh, families uh, from Jabal al-Baba in the outskirts of Jerusalem okay. in a uh, move which is completely in defiance of international law. We will certainly address uh, where this leaves the U.S. as a peacemaker um, just a little later in the discussion. First of all, Ian, I just want to raise the point with you because uh, this is a perfectly legal move, isn't it, that uh, the PLO office is closed if it doesn't meet the conditions that have been placed on it. I mean, there's nothing untoward about the actual act of closing the office. The question mark, perhaps, sits over the timing of it. Well, I mean, I think what this is, is this is a legal move, certainly, mm. um, in response to a congressional decision, but it's a legal move with extremely uh, uh, significant political and diplomatic implications. And I think that if you look at the history of the, the way this, uh, this came into being, you understand it a little better. It was this amendment to the existing law was made in response to the advances made by the PLO in international fora, the UN and then in its membership of the International Criminal Court. And of course the, on the Palestinian side, the, uh, what's, what's being discussed, as President Abbas said at the UN in September, is using the ICC to challenge uh, the legality of Israeli settlement activities. Mm -hmm in the occupied territories. So it's a legal requirement, but it's there for very, very uh, clear reasons that are uh, hostile to the Palestinians' ability to challenge the status quo. And indeed, it puts the US administration in a difficult position and certainly open to the sort of charges we've already heard about its status as, um, as an impartial uh, broker in this very difficult thing, non-existent at the moment, it has to be said, called the peace process. Which, which brings me to my next question, Hillary. Why has the State Department decided to go ahead with this? Well, there is a there was a legal track here that the State Department had, I would say, almost no leeway to control. The law required the Secretary of State to certify in November that the Palestinians were meeting the conditions of this legislation that was passed by the U.S. Congress, this amendment to the legislation, passed by the U.S. Congress and signed into law by President Obama in December 2015. So it's not a new law, and it wasn't something mm. created under the Trump administration. But the requirement was the Secretary of State had to certify in November this month that the Palestinians were not supporting uh, international criminal court investigations into Israeli war crimes, including Israeli settlement activities, and that the Palestinians were not uh, being accepted into international organizations, UN agencies, like Interpol, where they were accepted, the largest international police organization, where they've been accepted as a state. These things violate the U.S. law, and um, the State Department had to basically follow that law or be in violation of, of U.S. law. So here, I think the State Department didn't have that much legal leeway, but of course, the political ramifications could be quite significant. Mm. Kais, there is a get-out clause, isn't there? There's 90 days within which Trump, President Trump can overturn this decision if... Palestinians show that they're in direct and meaningful negotiations with Israel. I mean, that's, that's quite a big if, isn't it? Are they in direct and meaningful negotiations with Israel? 
Look, uh, this uh, argument about the legal side of the question is completely irrelevant because the PLO, the uh, State of Palestine, has joined the ICC since uh, 2012. This is five years ago. And since then, the uh, State Department in the United States have certified to the Congress that uh, the <coughs> The PLO and the State of uh, and Palestine is in complete compliance with the uh, requirements of uh, peace process or engagement in the peace process. So what we have now is a new uh, move, a new policy, uh, which is based or which is, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, using the uh, legal uh, part of the question as uh, pretext and as an argument. On the other hand, uh, why is it uh, uh, forbidden mm. for the uh, Palestinians to resort to international law in order to defend uh, themselves against actions that the whole world uh, realizes or recognizes as uh, violations of international law. I mean, that, that's a fair law. question, isn't it? Ian Black, perhaps you can address that to us. That, uh, Why indeed is it forbidden for the Palestinians to address the ICC for what it calls war crimes by the Israelis? Well, I mean, you know, again, we, we, we've already answered the question. This was, this was an amendment to a law uh, passed by Congress and approved by President Obama, and that law is not in accordance with that uh, mm -hmm. spirit that the Palestinians have the right to appeal to international law. It is, it is in effect, uh, biased against them. There's but no why does it exist? That. Uh, the fact that well, it exists because in the United States there, is, uh, there are political forces which are favorable to the view that the Palestinians should not have that right, and uh, in, in that sense, favorable to Israel. It is a built-in bias in the American political system expressed in a law passed by uh, Congress and approved by President Obama. President Obama, after all, he came into office in 2008 with great hopes attaching to him to what he was going to do to advance the, uh, the, the, the Middle East peace process. But he failed to do that. And Palestinians were understandably disappointed with that failure. The fact that this law was passed and into law on his watch is uh, part of the same story, that he wasn't able to go willing or able to go far enough to meet Palestinian aspirations to translate those into uh, a, a workable peace process. And this law reflects that. And it's the timing of this is unfortunate mm. because uh, it, it, it comes at a time when there is talk, at least, of some kind of new initiative being launched. This if it goes ahead in the way that we've been discussing, will make it even more difficult than it already is. Is Hillary, what do you think President Trump thinks of this? Because it doesn't really play into his narrative, does it, of wanting to find what he calls the ultimate right. plan in the Middle East? Exactly. You know, I don't disagree with my colleague at all in Ramallah. And I think this issue has been, has been boiling, particularly in Washington, um, and in the Netanyahu government, since the Palestinians have become more more active in their own advocacy to ha gain protections from the International Criminal Court and mm. to be part of international agencies. But the issue for the Trump administration is that this was something proceeding on a legal track. It's not something that they pushed for. It's not something I think that they wanted. And frankly, I'm not sure it's even something they clearly understood. From what I understand from colleagues at the State Department, they weren't even sure what the decertification process would mean and the ramifications. You have here in Washington a really bifurcated process where the White House, under the person of Jared Kushner and Mr. Greenblatt, uh, President Trump's longtime advisor and friend, the two of them are really in charge in their own bubble of pursuing the grand Middle East peace process. Mm. And the State Department is really left to do the work-a-day work bureaucratic um, requirements of the U.S. law and U.S. bureaucracy. 
for Jared Kushner and Mr. Greenblatt, although they have mm -hmm. made nice words to the Palestinians on their trips, their focus has been almost entirely on gaining the support of the Saudis in the person of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and the Emiratis uh, as well. They see those two players as the key to the peace process. And what's happening with the Palestinians, this is an unfortunate bump in the road from what I from what I'm hearing from their perspective, but it's not that critical. It's not that important. Okay. Uh, Kai, so what, what do you make of Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt's efforts um, to come up with a new Middle East peace deal? Have they, how, how much have they been in conversation with the PLO? The whole uh, team which is dealing with the uh, uh, conflict uh, and uh, trying to formulate a new formula for the so-called ultimate deal uh, in the region is completely uh, biased to the Zionist uh, right-wing point of view. Uh, and some of them are also involved in settlement activity in the uh, West Bank and East Jerusalem, including their uh, ambassador in Israel, which, who is one uh, of the four or five people who are dealing with, who are formulating this, uh, this plan. And uh, we believe that uh, this uh, involvement, it's not only a bias, but it is a direct involvement uh, by uh, this group in the uh, uh, settler colonialist enterprise, uh, including a support uh, for the continuation of settler activity and for the continuation of the uh, set settlements even uh, within the framework of a peace plan, which is something that the Palestinians cannot accept, the Arabs cannot accept, okay. and in the final analysis it will con completely undermine the prospects of a peace uh, deal in the in the region. Uh, Ian, well, that doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? I mean, it's supposed to be the deal of the century. This term has been banded about since April, and yet we do know very little about it. Despite there being various leaks, nothing has been concreted, and we are expecting uh, to have some sort of blueprint uncovered in the new year. Do you think there's going to be any progress seen? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that whatever is uncovered, revealed in the new year, I'm not sure it's going to be that surprising. I think we've seen enough evidence in public of, of the sort of direction that the Trump administration is looking at. We've already mentioned Saudi Arabia, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. We talk of little mm. else these days. Mm. The Saudi crown prince makes headlines all the time. I think it's fairly clear that there is an important axis between the Trump administration and the Saudis. I think that the relevant parts of a potential peace initiative must include the Saudi uh, the Arab peace initiative drawn up by the Saudis in 2002. It's worth remembering that that was about the recognition of Israel by all Arab states in return for a just solution to the Palestinian question. That's one part of it. I find it hard to imagine that won't be uh, a significant element of whatever's being uh, cooked up. Uh, the Saudis uh, are interested in uh, better relations with Israel, mm -hmm. but I believe that they're not able to do that openly, at least, without some visible uh, effort to resolve the Palestinian issue. We've seen Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, summoned to Riyadh just the other day. Um, we've seen these ongoing issues about reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas, uh, in which the Saudis have some say as well. These are elements of a, a possible Trump a deal of the century. Is it likely to happen? My own feeling, and I think many people who follow this conflict would agree, my own feeling is that without something very close to long-standing Palestinian aspirations for an independent state, self-determination, capital East Jerusalem, uh, then that deal is not going to happen. I would be amazed if something less than that could actually work. But I think the Saudi direction, that grand initiative, that deal of the century, those are some of the things we're talking about. Are the Palestinians, for example, being asked to give up the right of return, a very important mm. part of their long-standing uh, demands? We don't know yet, but those are some of the 
bits and pieces that I think would have to be uh, on the table. Is it going to happen? I'm not personally holding my breath. OK. Hilary, do you think that the dynamics in the region, some of those uh, elements that Ian mentioned there, particularly Saudi sort of mm -hmm. uh, new manoeuvres um, throughout the region, do you think they're enough to see uh, a, a fresh approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Well, you know, let me say, I share my colleague's pessimism on what reality will dictate to us as an outcome here in terms of any kind of uh, Middle East peace. Mm. But the view within the Trump administration is, is very different, and I think it's important to understand and to take seriously. They see the, an unprecedented closeness in terms of the uh, relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia in the person of Jared Kushner and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and between President Trump Trump and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman mm. in Saudi Arabia. They see unprecedented closeness between the United States and the United Arab Emirates with Mohammed bin Zayed. They see the prospect for an alliance between the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Israel as real and unprecedented and historic. They think the power of the Palestinians is at an all-time low. They think they have quashed Hamas, almost destroyed Hamas, routed it from, from Gaza, and really destroyed its leadership. They think that the Palestinian leadership overall is ripe for, tur for turnover. They're looking not at President Abbas, really. They're really looking at someone like Mohammed Dahlan, who's supported heavily by the United Arab Emirates. So the perspective within the White House, I think, is very different than many of us who are looking at the, the region in what I would call a more realistic way. But the perspective in the White House is different, and it's important to understand and take seriously because they're acting on it. They're acting in close coordination with the Saudis and the Emiratis and other Palestinians uh, who are not necessarily represented uh, in Ramallah today. Kais, is this something that you feel, that other members of the PLO feel, that there's a very different approach being taken by Trump and his White House, and indeed that the Saudis are putting pressure on Abbas to fall into line? If these are the prospects or the perspective of the uh, Trump administration, I think that they are drowning themselves in illusions because this will uh, materialize in nothing but uh, playing with fire in the uh, region and uh, uh, exploding uh, all the inner uh, conflicts, including the conflicts that have to do with the Palestinian cause. I do not think that there is a possibility for any Arab government, uh, whatever uh, uh, their uh, inner uh, uh, desires are, it is not impossible for any Arab government actually to normalize uh, the relations with Israel, mm. let alone uh, allying themselves with Israel without a just solution, and a just solution uh, for the Palestinian cause is outlined in the Arab peace plan, which was originally a Saudi plan, that is, complete Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories in 1967, a Palestinian independent state in these territories, and the uh, solution of the uh, Palestinian uh, refugee problem on the basis of international law and International Resolution 194. These are the three tenets on which normalization uh, between the Arab and Muslim countries with, the, with Israel could okay. be affected. Otherwise, I do not think that uh, any Arab country will dare to uh, have open relations with the Israelis, let alone an open alliance Ian, with them. just very quickly, in less than a minute, what will it take then for any real progress to be made here? It's, it's hard. To, it's hard to see. I mean, I think that, that you know. I think I agree with everything that we've that everybody has said. Mm. Um, I don't think that the Trump administration is being realistic. I think that there is this fantasy about Saudi Arabia. It's much more about Iran. I think that things between the United States and Saudi Arabia could make a difference with Iran. I don't believe they can make a difference on the Palestinian issue for the reasons that we've all uh, mentioned. I think it is a fantasy and a dangerous one because okay. it will leave the status quo uh, in a very volatile state. Very interesting indeed. There we will have to leave the discussion today. Definitely, we'll be repeating uh, the discussion or revisiting the discussion, should I say, um, as the year draws to a close. Many thanks to all of us for joining us, all of you for joining us, Kais Abdul Karim, Hilary Mann Leverett, and Ian Black.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, bye for now.